Okay, so this month we're going to talk about WinRT, uh, programming to WinRT with standard C++ using C++ slash WinRT. And I'm not going to go into super low-level detail on this stuff because there are already great CPPCon videos that cover it uh, by the implementers, Kenny Kerr and uh, James McNellis. Um, although I think the implementation is by Kenny Kerr and James McNellis was just one of the presenters on one of the talks. But um, So let's just start out with a brief history of programming to Windows. We started with Win 16 on DOS, which is a 16-bit. It's you know it's object-oriented in quotes. It's a C API, and objects are represented by handles. And when you want to make a method call, it's basically a C function call with the handle as the first argument to the function. And then with uh, Win 9x and Windows NT, we got Win 32, which is 32-bit API, but it still handles. But in Win32, they started introducing services through interfaces exposed via COM. And we'll talk about COM in a second. Win64 is really just 64-bit variant of Win32. So uh, Win64, it's kind of more like uh, an implementation detail in, in the sense that people just generically talk about Win32 as the API for Windows. And you know whether it is 64-bit pointers or 32-bit pointers the API doesn't really matter it's just a matter of how you build the code as not so much as that there's different APIs for the different platforms 64-bit platform versus a 32-bit platform and now they have WinRT which is the Windows runtime and uh, I think officially they spell runtime as one word not two as I've got it there but this is a pure object-oriented API, and everything is exposed as objects via COM. So in Win32, because it originates as a C API with its Win16 heritage, the newer features of the operating system show up as COM interfaces, and you have to deal with that. And they actually have a method for mechanically generating a C API for all of the COM uh, interfaces and their methods although I, I I literally know zero people who have ever programmed to that but it's possible um, everybody by the time com comes along they're using C++ and interacting with interfaces so what is this com thing well it's the component object model and this is a, a binary interface standard for software components first introduced in 1993 that's almost 30 years ago so this thing's been around for a while it's tried true and tested and what's also interesting about it is that it's language neutral so the software landscape in 1993 looked a little bit different um, object-oriented Pascal was popular from a, a product that Borland made called Delphi and Visual Basic was popular uh, bef uh, before ev even before the popularity of Visual Basic 6, which is where COM really took off. but uh, And C was popular, and C++ was becoming more popular. So being language neutral was important. Um, it is, COM is object-oriented, so everything is through objects. There's um, a few global functions that are what you use to get bootstrap your way to your first object interface but otherwise everything is built around interfaces and com just specifies a base le level infrastructure for getting objects creating an instance of an object obtaining interfaces from an object an object may implement one or more it has to implement at least one interface and from that one interface every object is required to implement which is called I unknown you can query for other interfaces that the object may implement. And COM also specifies it, the uh, infrastructure for managing the object lifetimes. It's basically reference counting. And in COM, you're both a consumer of interfaces and a producer of interfaces. And in the more complex uh, standards that are built on top of the COM mechanisms, 
sometimes the application implements an interface and acts as a sync to the system and other times the application consumes an interface and acts as a uh, a source the the interface is the system is the source and the application is pulling from the system by making method calls on the interface when the application acts as a sync it gives its interface implementation pointer to the system and then the system calls back into the application by making method calls on the interface and that's syncing data into the application so um, you can also use this infrastructure for creating your own components and creating your own object-oriented binary uh, component mechanism within your application within a suite of applications uh, whether you choose to register them with the system or not is up to you uh, you don't you can use the, all these mechanisms for your own internal objects without registering these objects on the system and therefore other applications can't invoke pieces of your insides you know so you can keep your proprietary stuff proprietary but you can still take advantage of the mechanisms so stuff you might have heard of that's built on com OLE object linking and embedding this is when you have a live Excel spreadsheet inside a word document the way that works is there's an instance of Excel that's running and it exposes the functionality through a set of interfaces that it implements and then the word document is hosting the instance of Excel inside it and negotiating the user interface all the key all the mouse clicks and all the keystrokes and all of that it's a, a cooperative arrangement that is spelled out in a big pile of interfaces that are implemented by objects and that's what allows uh, word to be a host for the embedded object and it's what allows Excel to be an embedded object hosted by another application um, OLE automation is on top of all that and that provides a mechanism to expose com objects and their interfaces to scripting languages scripting languages being more dynamic so they they can't statically bind themselves to the interfaces the interfaces have to have some way of describing themselves so that um, the scripting language can query what the method strings are for instance and how to pass arguments back and forth all of that stuff is specified through OLE automation uh, if you've done any game or graphics pro 3d graphics programming on Windows not using OpenGL then you were probably using Direct3D which is part of DirectX and that's all COM based so it's all methods on objects if you wanted to extend the Windows GUI that is done through the Windows shell and it's it's again you implement interfaces that the shell specifies um, for your extension and you register those extensions with the shell and now your DLL is getting invoked by the Windows shell and while that's a really cool concept it's also the reason why sometimes you context menu on an item in the file system and it takes a really long time for the context menu to get populated and that's because it's going and scraping everything up out of the registry to find out who's registered for this kind of object type in the file system and who's providing possible extensions to the context menu because it can't dynamically add those extensions in as it discovers them it, it, it goes and discovers everything first and then builds the menu um, the popularity of VB6 Visual Basic 6 where you could drag and drop components to build a GUI um, this is kind of the predecessor of Windows Forms in C Sharp uh, in terms of that drag and drop construction methodology for building up a GUI um, really VB6 is the thing that made com objects become a huge market success um, because it meant I could write a an efficient object that does some task in C++ and because my object is written to support interface via com which is language neutral it could be consumed from BV6 and everything just worked so VB6 drop all these objects together to build up your form write some events to glue everything together some event handlers poof you know now I've got an application and you could do um, a lot of interesting things that way 
Um, and then there's this thing called the .NET platform. Uh, is .NET implemented on COM? No. It's influenced by the experience of using COM for the 10 years prior to .NET being introduced, and it has a lot of similarities. It's easy to consume COM objects from .NET, and it's easy to implement COM objects from .NET. And .NET interoperates with COM really well, but it isn't implemented via COM. In other words, COM is not the enabling technology that creates .NET. Although it, they play really well together, but it's a completely separate thing. It has a virtual machine, which is not part of COM. It has the um, intermediate language, which is the, you know, the virtual machine assembly language for .NET and all of it. it has all those other things. So there's similarities, but it it is not um, implemented using COM. So what is WinRT? Um, Windows Runtime is a platform agnostic component and application architecture implemented in C++. That's how Wikipedia describes it. And, you know, for a while, uh, Microsoft, their, you know, their marketing department always seems to muddy the waters, shall we say. <laughs> there was a while where WinRT, which is what I think of as this API, they were kind of labeling it as, you know, the next version of Windows or the um, the name for the GUI or whatever. It's just the I I can't tell you the number of people I've talked to and I said, oh, we, you know, it's done using WinRT, and they're like, oh, WinRT is dead. It's not a thing. And I'm like, yes, it is. We're talking about two different things. And the one you are talking about that is dead, that isn't a thing, is a fault of the marketing department. It has nothing to do with the technology. But really, Windows Runtime is a new version of the Windows API where the entire API is accessed via COM interfaces. And there's, um, because there's this kind of uh, layer of indirection through interfaces, WinRT applications can be run in a sandboxed environment, kind of, you know, they can have this spun up little mini virtual machine for it. Um, it allows WinRT applications to be sold through the Windows Store and be certified. Um, it can, the sandboxing makes it less likely that one of these applications could make a permanent change to your system settings or anything like that. It's the whole point of running things in a sandbox. But more importantly, all the services are provided through COM via interfaces, uh, unlike the Win32 API, where some things are provided through C API style functions and other things are provided through COM. Generally, the more recent things are provided through COM and the older things are through functions. And the interfaces here are described by language agnostic metadata. And there's a... Um, ECMA standard that they created for .NET that describes the format of the metadata files so anybody could parse them if they wanted to. Anybody could write tools that parse the files that hold the metadata. The metadata is the one true source of information about the API. So each language that wants to target WinRT uses a language projection that exposes the interfaces described in the metadata to that programming language in as natural way as possible. Uh, and WinRT includes many of the same components that are familiar to C Sharp and .NET developers. I don't know what the crossover there is, or crossover is there, but I, I believe it's, um, at least as far as the WinRT surface, everything you could see from .NET, you can see from C++. Does that mean that there are things accessible in .NET that aren't accessible from C++? Sure, because as I said, .NET is a completely separate platform, and although it interoperates with COM, just because something is available in .NET doesn't mean it's available as a COM object. And at a bare minimum, something has to be available as a COM object to be in WinRT. Now, I believe it's Microsoft's intention to provide parity between WinRT and the .NET platform but I don't know 
off the top of my head, you know, to, to what extent they've been able to accomplish that. But as we'll we'll look at a, a more example or advanced example later, and we'll see that it it it, it looks pretty darn close. So what is C++ slash WinRT? So it's the C++ language projection for the WinRT API. Um, it uses only ISO C++ 17. So no language extensions, no MSVC specific code. You can even compile it with Clang. If you want to compile your code with Clang, for instance, as we discussed last month, you might want to be using Clang to get better error diagnostics. So not going to be a problem. They ship a tool called CPP WinRT and this is the tool that reads the the WinRT metadata and generates a header only library that allows you to call the functions uh, or the methods and interfaces described by the metadata so this is handy because if you get a third party WinRT component and say that component doesn't ship with a C++ language projection but it does ship with component metadata so you can generate the C++ language projection yourself for that third-party component um, you can also use it to you know for whatever reason if you want to you can regenerate the language projection for the entire WinRT system so the system API uh, you why would you want to do that well it, it the projections ship with the Windows SDK, but you might want to um, generate a subset of the metadata into the header-only library, put that into your source tree so that when you build your application, you're building for a specific version of the WinRT runtime, uh, rather than ha requiring people that want to build your code, say it's an open source application, to have the particular version of the Windows SDK that has that particular uh, metadata version on it. So how does this stuff work? Well, it's a header only library, so you would guess correctly that templates are involved. Template classes are used to provide marshalling shims to cross the COM barrier. And what that means is as a consumer of these interfaces you get something that is clean and you don't have to worry about low-level details and the as I said the com objects are lifetime managed by reference count so constructors add the reference and destructors remove the reference and everything just works as as when we look at the simple example we'll, we'll see an example of that how it's it's very clean there's a minimal amount of boilerplate and a minim minimal amount of syntactic noise for you to consume these interfaces and that is all done through the magic of template classes, variadic templates and uh, implementation details that are hiding all this noise from you. Now that if for some reason you need that lower level access you can obtain it. it, it it's, it's not like they're hiding things from you and you have no control over that you can get access to the lower level facilities if you if for some reason you need to perhaps you're trying to migrate some legacy code up to using WinRT and you need to deal with some low-level com style method invocation you know via ATL or or something like that some in older code but for, for, for newer code that you're writing from scratch it, it, it looks very similar to C sharp as we'll see all the error handling is done with exceptions except when throwing an exception could cross an ABI boundary so for instance com does not use exceptions internally but we want to use exceptions so we don't have to do deal with all the uh, testing of error codes that are mandated by com so what happens is suppose we are using WinRT to implement a method on an interface and we throw an exception the shim that is provided by the WinRT implementation will catch our exception, turn that into the corresponding error code, and make sure that it's the error code that is returned by our COM interface so that the caller, which may not be written in C++, the caller could be written in some other language like you know Pascal, Visual Basic, what have you, C Sharp. 
the caller will receive that error code and then it's uh, usually there's some piece of language infrastructure in the caller's side of things that turns that error code back into the normal uh, error handling mechanism for that language you know for .NET it probably gets turned back into an exception um, constructors and destructors are used to manage object lifetimes and keep track of open references to interfaces so if you um, have create if you've created an object and you've stored it in a local variable and then you have uh, another local variable where you assign it because it's assignment that now you've got two local variables referring to the same object and so the reference count is increased they have move support so that if what you intended was the the new uh, the left hand side of the new assignment wasn't if your intention was to transfer ownership to that object then you could do a stood move as you assign it and the original object original variable rather will no longer hold a reference to the object it's just an empty container um, but mostly uh, object values just look like regular types you don't need to do smart pointers yourself if you've done uh, ATL com programming in the past you, you had to man uh, it was up to you to maintain the smart pointers that wrap the interfaces here the language projection takes care of all that for you so you just get to write code more naturally and you don't have to worry about uh, managing the smart pointers yourself and because everything is a header implementation it provides more optimizing opportunities to the compiler and this results in smaller and faster executables um, they also have coroutine support um, as I looked at some of the implementation it looked to me like they were using the C++ 17 coroutine support from experimental so the headers say bracket experimental slash coroutines um, and they're using coroutines for asynchronous operations so a lot of the WinRT uh, methods and objects are asy have, have asynchronous operations because they're um, you know that's a, a more modern design style so if you're reading from a file or you're reading from something something on the network or you're doing any kind of communication that could be potentially blocking usually what happens is they are returning an asynchronous result and then you can either synchronize on the asynchronous result if you need it right away or you can hold that result for a while until you need it to give that asynchronous operation a chance to complete and then you can obtain the result so they're using coroutine mechanisms to implement that and this uh, CPPCon 2016 talk embracing standard C++ for the Windows runtime that you can find on YouTube uh, that's the presentation I mentioned with James McNellis and Kenny Kerr that describes in detail uh, how a lot of this stuff is implemented if you're interested but um, I think it's kind of a it's kind of a nice to know level of information it's not need to know if you want to consume the WinRT RT API from C++ you don't need to know those things there's not even stuff in there I would say is need to know because of like gotcha corner cases they've just done a really good job on the language projection you can just use it as is and it just kind of all works as we would expect so that's how it works but how well does it works um, so the previous solution for consuming WinRT from C++ was a uh, special version of the compiler called C++ slash CX and James and Kenny in their presentation do a breakdown showing how the C++ WinRT language projection compares to C++ CX and how it compares to .NET and in in their examples and I and I can believe that this would be fairly consistent across all application domains the C++ WinRT components are smaller and faster than their C++ CX implementations and both C++ implementations are smaller and faster than the .NET implementations um, you also from C++ of course you have the advantage that you can determine deterministically manage resource lifetimes so no garbage collection um, you can have you know 
custom allocators for improving the efficiency of allocating and deallocating lots of small objects of the same type, arena allocators, etc. They've also, um, now Kenny Kerr create, started creating this language projection before he went to work for Microsoft, but now he has been working at Microsoft for probably, uh, probably like five, seven years, and that's at this point. And so they've closely worked with the compiler team to recognize various COM idioms and various WinRT idioms so that the compiler can optimize them. And if you're um, a little bit familiar with COM, as I said, every object has to implement IUnknown, and that's how you navigate between interface implementations on a single object instance. Uh, IUnknown contains a query interface method that you can use to say, you know, do you, here's the universal identifier for this other interface. Do you implement it? And it says yes or no. And if it says yes, it gives you back a pointer to the interface. Now, the list of interfaces that an object implements is known at compile time. So uh, Kenny actually describes how they were able to create a const expr function that would determine at compile time whether or not query interface would succeed or not. And then based on that, they can decorate query interface as a pure function and this allows the compiler to apply more aggressive optimizations to it. So I thought that was kind of a neat little you know way down in the plumbing kind of trick. But as a result of these compiler optimizations the C++ WinRT code is able to be smaller and faster than the counterparts in other languages which I found really interesting. So what does this look like? Well, here is the entire program for a little piece of code that goes off and I have a RSS feed that I create. This is on, uh, this URL is on my personal account on my ISP and it enumerates out the latest PDFs that have been scanned into this vintage computing repository called BitSavers. And so this code the first thing at the top there, the pragma lib, is just so we get a link into the boilerplate infrastructure that every WinRT application has to have. So everything you see on the screen here is all that is needed to compile this file and get a working executable. There's no extra linking steps that need to be specified or any compiler flags or anything. So the WinRT headers, those are the headers generated by the CPP WinRT language projection tool. And of course, IOStream is our friend that we're just going to use to write out the output. Everything is inside uh, the WinRT namespace. And each set of interfaces described in WinRT is inside a namespace and you can pretty much see that the namespaces map to what is the prefix of the header that we included so windows.foundation.collections all of that stuff is inside the windows foundation namespace and windows web syndication namespace brings in the or makes visible the uh, declarations for syndication client syndication feed and syndication item, which I've just written it as const auto item, but the actual type is syndication item. So we got a URI class that lets us build a URL and a syndication client. And from that client, we retrieve the RSS feed from that syndication client. And that's an asynchronous operation. But right here, we just a method chain on the get because we immediately need the results. We're not going to we don't have any else, any other things we can do usefully while that uh, fetch is taking place asynchronously. And then we can just do a range for loop over the items collection. And for each item, we can get the text of the title. And then we can print out the title as a C style string. Now, H string, you might notice, is a little different being in all lowercase. And as I mentioned earlier, there is marshalling across the com boundary between the language and com and strings are one of the things that have to be marshaled 
and it's a standard com uh, data type so instead of it being provided by um, a WinRT interface it is provided as part of the infrastructure so each string is a class that is provided by WinRT. Its its implementation is basically fixed. It's provided in a base.h if you go look in the headers. And that's what gives us our ability to get strings in and out of WinRT. So let's go take a look at what this code looks like. So here was that here's that exact code that I just showed you. Now I created this by just saying create a blank oops create a blank Windows console application project. So this project doesn't know anything about WinRT, it doesn't know anything about the language projection, it doesn't know anything except standard C. The only setting I had to change from the default was I went to well it's it's bubbled up here I had to change this from the def the default is ISO C++ 14 so that was the only thing I had to change was to change it to C++ 17 and if we here let me get my output window over here so we can just see the build going if I just say rebuild, it'll compile this. Now you'll notice that it takes quite a while to compile that source.cpp even though it doesn't have much in it. And that's because these generated headers, these generated headers, can, can contain quite a bit of code. Since it's a header only library, there's, there's, it's, it's all in there. And so they each header that is generated for a namespace for a set of interfaces and so on is obviously including other headers to get other things that it depends on so it can be quite a bit so generally the recommendation is to use either pre-compiled headers or to use modules now that we have modules in C++ 20 and the hope is that um, a module based version of these headers will be uh, much more efficient because they can provide they can provide the pre-compiled module implementations as part of the SDK I don't think they've shipped that yet um, and in fact on my little sample here in order to get it to run correctly I had to target a slightly older version of the SDK the current version most recent version I have on my machine is 1N041 and that had a hard time with some of the asynchronous infrastructure so I just went one version back and from your solution there's this retarget solution that can be used to take care of that but let's take a look here this uh, init apartment if you're if you're not familiar with com programming com programming has threading models and the most commonly used uh, threading model is so is the so-called single threaded apartment model and that's what this is setting up so this is basically our com initialization that function is provided to us by WinRT so if we drill into it we can see here we are in that base.h header that I mentioned this is all the common base infrastructure stuff that's needed by uh, any um, WinRT application and you can see all they're doing is delegating off to the RO initialized function that's provided in WinRT and that comes back with one of these COMH results and they're checking to see if the call succeeded and if it didn't succeed it turns it into an exception so because it's header only if you're really if you're curious about how any of these things are implemented you can always drill down so here's their implementation for the URI class you can see they're saying it derives from I URI runtime class and then it has a requirement that the URI so here's curious recurring template pattern 
URI requires I stringable and it requires I runtime class with absolute canonical URI. Here's the methods that are exposed on that class. So we've got a default constructor. Oh, sorry. We have constructors with parameters. And there's a couple of static methods. And if you're at all familiar with COM programming, you might be saying, wait, 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 wait. How can you do static methods? Uh, and they have a way that static methods turn into uh, you instantiate an object that holds methods for all the static methods on your class and then that uh, one instance of that uh, object holding the static methods for your class that one instance can serve all instances of the class right because they're static methods they don't vary behavior based on the instance otherwise they would be instance methods and not static methods and the obtaining of that interface pointer to that object that represents the static methods is cached so you're not querying it over and over if you're calling these static methods repeatedly and so on they they explain this in their uh, cppcon talk it's it's quite um, interesting from an implementation perspective but from a client perspective it's just like yeah all I need to know is if I need to unescape component I can just call that method statically and in the WinRT documentation for these interfaces, it will be shown as a static method. So you can know which ones are static and which ones are instances. So here I am. I'm building a URL, et cetera, et cetera. If we want to step through this code, we can run it real quick. Let me get the console window where you can see it. So here I am at my breakpoint. If I want to, I can step into these methods if if I want it their Visual Studio has a feature called not just my code is what they call it and so because these headers are coming from the system they're not marked as my code so by default if you step over or step in it's the same because it doesn't consider the WinRT language projection to be your code you can force a step in there's multiple ways to do it, but one way I do it is to just do Control F11, which kind of steps you into the assembly language. And we jump through a little bit, and then we can do Control F11 again. So now we see we're in the default constructor for syndication client, which delegates to another constructor for syndication client that goes and gets the factory to, that says this is how I create syndication client objects. And then it ends up calling activate instance. This is all the low-level com machinery that you would have had to do if you were doing it yourself which is maybe interesting to you but the whole point of this is so we don't have to do all that junk ourselves so if we can just step back out here I've gotten uh, now I can step over this you can see it takes a bit because it's going out on the internet and fetching that RSS feed from my internet account and now we've got the feed locally in memory and we can start walking over the items and we can start printing them out and you can see there's the first one this is just the title of the item so it's not printing out the URL or anything else it's just printing out the title and if we run through that we can see that yeah it printed out a bunch of titles from that RSS feed now I don't know about you but if you've ever written C++ trying to do some you know HTTP fetches and get an RSS feed and parse the RSS feed and try to extract stuff out of it just so you could get some some text I mean I have never written so little code to do so much when interacting with you know RSS feeds and all like that even when I've the code that I wrote to generate this RSS feed is a Perl script that uses some Perl modules to do RSS feeds for generating it and, and that code is you know like pages and pages worth just to be able to generate the RSS file so to me this is like amazingly productive for getting at some of these uh, internet types that we're so used to dealing with that are very easy to deal with from a .NET programming perspective but have been frankly just a big pain in the butt to try and access from C++ and 
even though this is Windows only, I am looking at this code and I'm saying, you know what, if I need to whip up something quick and it needs to interact with some of these, um, you know, kind of web land things, but for whatever reason I need to do it in C++ and, and C Sharp isn't going to cut it. Or maybe I'm not up to speed on C Sharp, uh, but I am up to speed on C++. This feels really just like C++ value types. I don't see any smart pointer junk here. The only weird thing is this init apartment, but it's I just need to remember to do that in my main function before I do anything else. I don't really need to know what it's doing or why it has to be there, but it, if I do that, then I'm good to go with all this other stuff. And uh, the only thing that might be a bit of a uh, pain is the fact that all the strings are wide character strings, but uh, you know you should be kind of comfortable with UTF anyway. Um, if you need to marshal it into a narrow string, there are ways that you can do that conversion if for some reason you need to get it into a, you know, really if you look, looked at my output here, well, it's gone, but, oh no, there it is. Uh, there's no, I mean, it's it's transported in XML and the XML can have UTF strings in it, but I happen to know that from the way this is generated that it's always guaranteed to be ASCII. So we could have, you know, bashed it into ASCII over here if, if we needed to in this particular case. But it um, doesn't hurt to be multi-language aware and be Unicode enabled. So that's why my URL is a long character string literal. And that's why my new line character is a long character literal. So let's look at a more complicated example. because I mean, that's nice and all, but it's... If, if we're going for WinRT, we're probably interested in like designing our user interface using XAML, using the um, XAML editing capabilities that are in Visual Studio and having that be supported. So my other example that we're going to show is this photo editor. Uh, and let me stop debugging that. So um, this is a sample that Microsoft has up on GitHub. Let me get this solution window over here so you can see it. And we'll bring the output window over here too. Actually, we'll make this a little bigger because we're going to take a look at some of this stuff. Um, so let's just run it and we'll see what this looks like first. So if we run this thing, let's get that. Okay. So it has gone to my photos folder and shown me a grid of my photos and let's we can pick a photo and then we can pick an effect to run on this photo so let's say we're going to invert it we can apply uh, we can go over here and zoom this out to fit screen and if we don't want to see that little edit box we can hide that and all of this user interface um, go back here and select a new photo and select a different effect let's say we'll do a blur and how much are we going to blur it we're going to can see it's blurring in real time as I'm dragging the slider we can apply that and then let's you know make that fit to screen again or show actual size so all of the processing for this application is written using C++ WinRT. The user interface code, so this title box up here, the image display down here, this little zoom button and the corresponding controls and this little edit button and the corresponding controls. Uh, we can reset, remove all the effects, select another effect like uh, it's not the best user interface design here where they got low contrast text but we can do a color shift, we can change the temperature and the tint, what have you. All of, all of that user interface interaction is all specified through a XAML file. So in our application here, we've got this app XAML, but the more interesting part here is the main page and detail page XAML. So here is the kind of the design view 
and then down here actually let's uh, hide that okay down here is the raw XML that is in the XAML and if you've done any of this sort of thing it's it, it, it's a declarative style user interface paradigm so what we're doing is using a XML file to describe the user interface elements and their properties and how the user interface elements are connected to each other and it also is using a data binding template so with uh, data binding it's a declarative way of saying well it's a list view well what are the items in the list well the items in the list are obtained from a data binding and it's the data binding that is accessed by the application when it goes to fill in the data it's not the directly accessing the control and by um, providing that extra level of indirection what you end up with is a situation where as most of us are working on teams you have a UI designer that's working in the XAML editor and is iterating on the XAML on the presentation of the data and collaborating with the developers to, to understand what the data bindings are between the application data and the user interface but the UI designer can work in parallel and iterate on their design without having to obtain new builds from the development team because the, the build is talking to the data binding so they can adjust the uh, properties of the user interface and how it is attached to the data binding and they can change it from a list view to a grid view to um, check boxes or what have you they can experiment with different user interface choices and quickly try them out without having to rebuild the code so that's the whole point of XAML based user interface design compared to tightly coupling these things like it would be in say an MFC application or a traditional C++ application so the way um, Visual Studio does it is that each of these XAML files has a code behind file so here on the detail page here is this detail page.cpp now this contains the manually written code so we see here that we've got a detail page object and it's inside this implementation namespace now personally I would not have put this inside the WinRT namespace because to me I would have viewed that like namespace standard I, I would have sta stayed out of there and just you know I would have just called it photo editor at the top but this is how that sample is written and you can see it's similar to how the code that we looked at before they've got a pre-compiled header to pull in all of that WinRT stuff um, which is going to be megabytes of header pull it in in a pre-compiled header more ideally C++ 20 we would use modules again I don't think they've got a module aware implementation of C the uh, language projection yet but that's where they're headed they've, they've said that that's where they're going to go to so I, I would not be surprised to see it show up at some point and similar to what we saw in our small example this you know using namespace WinRT to bring in the, the core WinRT infrastructure things like H string and a knit apartment those kinds of things and then they're using the namespaces for the WinRT objects that they are using in this code and although uh, you can see my resharper is saying hey um, you did a using namespace Microsoft graphics canvas up here so therefore specifying it again here is kind of redundant but I am kind of of the opinion that when you're bringing in these namespaces it's less ambiguous to the reader to specify it out in full um, but that's why it's ghosted like that and uh, you can you notice that although some of these prefixes are ghosted by resharper all of the terminal namespaces are not ghosted which means that we actually are using something in this file from all of those namespaces that are listed and you know if you look at this code I mean it it looks like really straightforward stuff I, I don't see any smart pointer noise I don't see any add ref release noise I don't see any try catch noise I don't see any of the low-level machinery bubbling up into my face and irritating me because it's all been hidden away in the language projection 
And as I mentioned, if for some reason, perhaps there's some case where they couldn't quite optimize it as efficiently as you would be able to optimize it by hand and it showed up in a performance profile, if you need to, you can dip down to the lower level and get the lower level ABI because it's a header only library, right? So you can always drill into any one of these things and see how they do it. Here's, let's go back. We were calling go to state method. And if we look at that, it's an impl, you know, on a, you know, doing a call factory where it is making a method call and supplying a lambda, you know, and the, and the, you know, the lambda is doing looks like this is a state machine visual state manager so it's doing a state transition so it's doing go to state again so if you needed to for some reason if a performance profile showed that any of this language projection was getting in your way and causing you a problem perhaps in some particular case it was you know doing unnecessary allocation or reallocation you can always expand it because it comes from a header only library. You can drill into the implementation, grab it, pull it apart, do the necessary things to get rid of that inefficiency. But I have a suspicion that they've already done that sort of uh, profiling. You can see those methods that we looked at are not particularly complicated. You know, they're just simple marshalling and delegation. So it's unlikely that it's, any performance problems are going to be originating in the language projection but in the rare weird case where that does happen since it's header only you can always drill down as low as you need to go so that is basically it I was pleasantly surprised that this little example here of getting items off an RSS feed and dumping them out was just like a simple one page piece of code that even fits on a slide and the only thing I needed to do in my project settings was to switch it to use C++ 17 and other than that it just compiled and worked poof like right out of the box I didn't need to adjust any linker settings I didn't need to do any now this this Windows app thing here with the pragma lib there's almost certainly a way that you could go here to add reference and obtain it that way. If we look back at the photo editor, they've got a bunch of the Windows runtime assemblies referenced here. So, you know, when you're hooked in through, and you'll notice this is a universal Windows project, whereas my simple example is just a plain old, you know, standard console application. I wrote my own main. Uh, if we look over, that was something that we, you might have noticed, if we step into this program from the very beginning, we'll see that we get into a XAML generated main, it's a win main, in fact it's a wide character signature win main, not that we're using this string, and you know, the first thing they do is call winrt init apartment, and then they call application start with a lambda that creates it makes an instance of our app because you uh, if you have a XAML application you call XAML application start and you give it an instance well you give it a in this case it's a lambda but um, I believe in other languages it's something like it ends up being a factory that creates your app we can drill into this make function and see that it's a, a very attic template function and this is to support all the types of interfaces that may be uh, implemented by your object that it is making an instance of this is this is a generic make function that can make any object and you see that it does a couple of checks here to find out, you know, we're doing a const expert check to find out does this thing, is one of the um, interfaces that is implemented by, uh, the default interface is implemented by the destination type. If it is an I activation factory, 
then we delegate to a specialized make function that that handles that if it is a I believe this is the case where the object we're requesting to be made is composable and uh, we need to cast the result so this as function is is basically an interface casting mechanism to cast from uh, say as I mentioned there's the I unknown and com that you use to query for the interfaces that are implemented by an object well if an object implements I foo and I bar but I foo and I bar don't inherit from one another in any way then that's there's no way to reach an I foo from an I bar or an I bar from an R foo uh, I foo directly by like casting to a base class or to a more derived class what you have to do is use query interface to obtain the one interface pointer from the other and that's what their as function does um, so they've you know in their little make function they've done some const expert checking so the, the relationship between these interfaces is known at compile time so a const expert if can identify that scenario and delegate to the appropriate specialized factory function or down here it is a uh, comcast interface cast so that they can handle they have one function that basically knows how to make all these different types of objects even though the the scenario or, or the sequence of operations that has to take place in order to create these different objects is different depending on the relationship of the object so lots of C++ magic going on under the hood and in the end it just means hey uh, I just write some really straightforward code and it just works now you might have noticed if your eyes are keen that hey you might have noticed hey this is generated code but it's got an application type mentioned in it so where did that come from and in this whole uh, Visual Studio kind of um, how do you call it uh, XAML designing world right where the the Visual Studio is generating code that corresponds to code that's in your XAML file XML in your XAML file so they the, the build system created this generated files folder this x64 debug this is where all our OBJs right reside we're used to that from buildings regular C++ applications on Windows but this generated files folder is where all the magic IDE generated boilerplate that glues together the XAML to our application code that's where it all ended up over here and I'm, I'm not a hundred percent certain uh, the reason why but obviously this app.xaml was copied from our source file directory over here so this this is our source file as we obtained it from github and the build system copied it over to here and then generated a header file and a uh, why do we have an H and an HPP? I guess the H is if we were going to consume this from C for some reason. I'm not. I'm not 100% certain on the role that all these generated files play. But you notice there's also some CPP files that are in here. Uh, I'm assuming that this one with a .g is generated with some data substituted in from a template, and this one is just um, needed, but copied over from some place where Visual Studio decided to get it um, I haven't worked in like .NET XAML land for a good number of years so a lot of this stuff has evolved to where I'm not tracking all the details but point is we were able to do XAML based UI design so that decouples the UI designing from the back-end business logic and the bridge between the two is the data binding that attaches controls to data sources 
So our business logic responds to events, fills data sources with data. Those data sources are bound into the UI. The UI gets updated. And as you saw when we were running that uh, application, it's you know pretty decent and efficient. Uh, obviously, you, you you fill a grid with you know a million grid items. It's going to take a while, but um, you know there's always a stupid way to use something smart. So that I think gives you an idea of how all this stuff works, and for simple things it's simple and for more elaborate things we've got high-level tools that let us leverage the facilities inside Visual Studio for team oriented UI design and we can write our bus you know business logic in C++ where it's going to be nice and efficient and fast and low resource consumption which is the way we want it so if there are any questions we can take those now And if you want to ask a question by voice, don't forget to unmute your microphone first. Or if you don't want to talk, there's also the chat window. You can type a question in there. Okay. Well, since there doesn't seem to be any... Okay, go ahead. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Okay, well, let me uh, 